hello. My name is Adam Jukes and I'm a psychoanalytic psychotherapist and group psychoanalyst. And this is the first of a series of video blogs um, covering some of the themes that I've written about in, in books previously. And after some consideration I decided I would do my first blog about sulking. And um, the, the main reason for that is because I think it's actually a universal phenomenon. And I'm going to begin by telling you what I think sulking is. And it's a very complex combination of emotions um, and also behaviours. When somebody's in a sulk, they feel as though they've been slighted, hurt, shamed, humiliated, and they feel deeply hurt. But they also feel very angry and want to retaliate against the person they think has hurt them. And often, sulks can't retaliate. There, there is a certain point in established relationships where sulks simply do act out and retaliate immediately in often very abusive ways, which I'll come back to. <clears throat> but in the main, most of us who are not serious sulks, in what I would call ordinary sulks, we don't act out, largely because the, the intensity of the impulse to retaliate, even when we're in the depths of the sock, feels disproportionate to the slight that we've experienced, even though it doesn't feel disproportionate to the pain that we're experiencing. And the, 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 the two things about the, the desire to retaliate is it, it's, it's informed by um, two things. First of all is the, 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 the sense that one has been treated unfairly. So there's a, a sense that this, was not, that this slight or rejection or hurt was not deserved. So it was unjust. So there's a strong sense of the injustice of the situation. And, the, and also the, the, there's a lot of righteous anger, even rage, which accompanies the desire to retaliate. And that, of course, is fed by the sense of injustice. But, of course, what sulks do is that they don't, most of us, most of us who are, I might call, well-adjusted, um, and I think that's about 40% of the population. No, actually, probably more, probably nearer 50%, I would guess. We, we can go into a sulk, very, a very short-lived sulk, and, you know, if we're emotionally mature and we have some insight, we can recognise that this is completely inappropriate. And we, can, we literally can't snap out of it and just if, you know, say, look, I'm really sorry, this was completely wrong, you know, and, and change our behaviour. Because the thing about people who, who, who sulk, and as, I think, as I say, I think that's all of us to a greater or lesser extent, I'm talking about ordinary sulking now, I'll come back to serious sulking in, in a moment, um, is that what, what sulks do, because they, 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 they can't express the sadness or the hurt to the person who they think has hurt them. Well, that, that sounds ridiculous. It's almost oxymoronic, isn't it? You've hurt me and now I'm going to cry so you can look after me. I mean, people don't do that. Um, is that so what, and, and they can't get angry because of the fear of excessive overreaction. So what sulks do is withdraw. And, and when we're in a sulk, we get walled off behind the, this complex of feelings of hurt, injustice, rage, and the desire to retaliate. And we, we stop communicating. And anybody who's raised teenage children, or indeed has raised children, will have seen this writ large. You know, the, the withdrawal, the truculence, the refusal to communicate, and so on. Now, when this happens in an adult relationship, you know, it can be quite bewildering to be with a partner who's going into a sock and sitting there refusing to respond and not cooperating and grunting, perhaps, you know. Now, for, for ordinary sulks, if, the, the, if, you, if you were to ask them, what, what are you doing? What, what's, the, what's the purpose of this behaviour? Of course, they would probably initially deny that there's any intent to it, you know, that they're just nursing the hurt, but in fact, that's not what they're doing. They might even say, well, look, I, what I was doing was sending out a message to the person who hurt me that they should approach me and repair the damage they've caused. And they could be quite sincere in saying that. They 
probably believe that that's what they're doing. But in fact, that's not what they're doing at all. And I've analyzed thousands of socks in my career. What they're doing is sending out this passive message to make the perpetrator approach them to repair the damage with an apology, or oh, I'm sorry, darling, I shouldn't have done that, blah, 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 whatever, do you want a cup of tea? So that that invitation is sent out passively, but, but the invitation is not that the other person should approach it in order to repair the damage. The invitation is that they should approach and try to repair the damage simply in order that the sock can reject them and inflict pain, because sulking is a form of punishment. We sulk in order to punish the person we think has hurt us. And, and, and the invitation to approach and the number of rejections, um, at least the number of rejections, is contingent on the sulk's decision that, that they've caused as much pain as, they were, as was inflicted on them. And so often that's visible when the, when the other person gets manifestly upset um, or, or gets really angry and, and leaves or you know, cries. And then so that, so that the sulk will either get afraid and think, oh God, I've gone too far, or that they'll see the other person getting visibly upset and crying or whatever, or just getting you know, anxious. And, and then they think, okay, uh, now it's fine. I've, I've hurt him or her as much as they hurt me, and so I can, I can now forgive them, rather begrudgingly initially, because it takes a little while to sort of work through the uh, uh, internal consequences of the sulk, because sulking damages the sulk as much as it damages the person it's intended to punish. Now, that's, that's a kind of dis a, a description of ordinary sulking. Now, for many years I worked with uh, men who suffered from really serious sulks, and they, the, 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 the sulk would invariably lead to very destructive behaviour, not just punishing people passively by withdrawing and so on and making them feel guilty and all those usual things. But the, the men that I worked with who were abusive were often extremely violent uh, and, and emotionally, psychologically, verbally abusive and very, very controlling of their partners, usually women, but not always. And every incident of sulking, of, of abuse that I, that I analyzed with, with my abusive patients, it was easy to see that they were always in a sock when they abused. No, of course, they were completely unaware of being in the sock because they go through the process so quickly after a little while that all they feel is this kind of incredible sense of injustice, you know, what I call the coffee cup syndrome. You know, the man comes home from work and suffers on the table and, you know, he's tired and a bit frayed. And then he's finished his supper, and this was actually an incident, a real incident. And his wife was going upstairs, and as she was going upstairs, she called down to him. He was drinking his coffee, and she, she, she said, would you mind putting your coffee cup in the dryer before you come to bed? And this man went berserk. I mean, he started smashing things, and he chased her up the stairs, and he, and he beat her. And, you know, his view of that was, you know, I've been out working all day. I'm exhausted. I come home. And she wants me to actually do my own washing up. I mean, it's, this is ridiculous, but this sort of thing is commonplace, really. It's certainly commonplace in my clinical experience. Now, that, so that, and that's obviously very dangerous. They ended up divorced, and he ended up in, in a cell, which was the appropriate place for him. So, um, the, 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 one of the questions is, what, what's the origin of sulking? The, clearly, it has its origins in childhood, and whenever we are in a sulk, however mild or serious, you know, people who are sensitive to it will say, "Oh, look, you're sulking. Just you know, snap out of it, grow up, suck it up, or whatever." Or we ourselves will recognise it and just get out of it. But the thing is that it always has its origins, and the, and the sense of injustice that, that accompanies every sulk always has its origins in childhood. And it's not the fact that there was a real injustice. It's just that it's, there seems to be some feeling that, you know, that, that almost innate about whether things are deserved or not. You know, and even children will say it's not fair. And th that statement, it's not fair, that it clearly is the origin of the sense of injustice. And if, if, if a child is not, you know, is, receives 
good enough treatment, what we might call averagely acceptable parenting, then you know the child will grow up relatively healthy, uh, without any serious unresolved complexes and so on, and and won't be serious sight. So that, that's what you might call the normal end of the spectrum. And then, but at the other end of the spectrum, there are children who are actually really badly treated, who are actually abused, whether physically, emotionally, sexually, and so on, um, either once or many more times, but where there is real damage, the, the capacity for sulking um, is, re, is reinforced and not worked through because most of us reach a point in our early development where we come to kind of, without really being aware of it, we come to terms with reality, you know, we, we, meet, we reach a rapprochement with the world, you know, we recognise that we're not going to get all of our needs met and, um, you know, then we're just going to have to deal with, to learn to deal with disappointment, which is actually terribly hard. Disappointment is very, very basic because it means that the world is not the way you want it to be or, th or think you have a right to expect it to be. Thankfully, most of us reach that rapprochement, but people with chronic sulks don't. And so you have this, this serious sulk who has been damaged and has never been able to reach a rapprochement and can go into what I call a clinical sulk. And I, I first wrote about sulking in, in, um, late in the 90s in one of my books. and. I, I use this expression, clinical sulking, and it created a bit of a storm, well, maybe that's too strong a word, a bit of a stir in, in the UK media. And, um, you know, it, it, one of the newspaper headlines was, it's official, sulking is an illness, you know, which is not at all what I'd intended. The fact that it's clinical does not mean that it's an illness, although it certainly can be in a chronic, lifelong sulk. But I was invited to go on to a radio program to discuss this with a very prominent celebrity psychiatrist. And he made what I thought was a very good joke. He said, you know, in, in all my life, he was a professor of psychiatry at a large London teaching hospital. And he said, look, in all my career, in all my life as a psychiatrist, I've never had one of my registrars come to me and say, professor, I've just admitted a man to the ward who's in the most appalling sulk. Well, I mean, I, I actually think it was very funny. And I laughed, even though I recognised that it, it, it was, although it was a joke, it was actually a, a, an apparently funny attempt to, to subvert me and diss me, for want of a better word. And I said to him, well, it's very unlikely that, you know, you'd, you'd admit somebody to the ward with a clinical sulk, apart from the fact that it even though it's often very hard to distinguish sulking from serious sulking from depression. And certainly a person in a serious sulk will often feel very depressed without having any insight whatsoever. But I said to him, it's very unlikely because people in serious sulks invariably act out and they act out in, in really destructive ways. And when I, when, I, when I say really destructive ways, I'm talking about not only beating up their partners, and being very sadistic emotionally and verbally and psychologically and so on and depriving them, socially isolating them or whatever. But even, but for, even from that end of the spectrum, at the other extreme, you, you have people whose sense of injustice is so strong that it's with the whole world. And, you know, if you read accounts of, you know, these sh mass shootings that go on, and very often journalists get to the nub of it quite quickly, that, you know, the man has, and it's almost invariably men, um, has experienced a slight. He's been rejected, he's been dismissed. Something that has shamed and humiliated him be beyond tolerance and that feels incredibly unjust to him. And, and, and he's flooded with not only the pain of it, but the righteous anger and the feeling that, th that these people have to pay. And, and, and righteous anger can be used to rationalise, justify any form of criminal or destructive behaviour. And, and that's what I said to the psychiatrist. I said, you know, these, you're, you're, more, you're much more likely to find these people in, in prison or in, in AA, you know, alcoholics, drug users, you know, that because the thing about sulking is it can not only be used to justify any amount of destructive behaviour to, um, to other people, it can also be used to justify destructive behaviour towards the self. Um, including and up to suicide. And um, 
frequently people do become self-destructive uh, when, when they're in serious sex. So what have I talked about? I've talked about sulking and what it's like. I've talked about the origins of it. I've talked about the sense of injustice. Um, oh, the other thing about the sense of injustice, which I think is really worth saying, and I'm, I don't have very much time left, um, is that when, when people tell me about their sense of injustice, I almost invariably say to them, if you're feeling a sense of injustice, you are almost certainly about to commit one. Well, I've, I've run out of time. Um, I hope you found what I've had to say useful and that you've enjoyed it. And um, look back again. There will be more vlogs in the near future. Thank you.